Last week we spent uh, our sermon uh, by Chris, helpfully to give us an overview of the chapters Exodus 32 to 34. It was helpful to see that big picture and that big narrative where we see uh, Israel's sin at the foot of the Mount Sion. They make this golden calf uh, as a God replacement or a God addition, something physical and tangible they can see. And while Moses then comes down the mountain in anger, uh, he, he plays an active role before God as an interceder and an advocate, uh, pleading on God not to blot them out. And then the Lord relents, and Moses offers himself up, goes back to the Lord. He reveals himself all the more, and we're going to come into that a little bit more next week. But we've done that huge narrative overview, three chapters, to help us grasp that big picture. And this week and next week, we're going to just dive in like a plumb line into one particular part of that narrative and just to really rest in the beauty of the truths that we see in it. So let me just read one small part from it. Uh, that's going to be particularly the emphasis of what we look at today. And I'd love you to follow along in your Bibles in front of you. Chapter 32, verses 11 to 14, and it'll also be on the screen uh, behind me. Let's read. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, that he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger. Relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised. I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you as we have traveled through this epic narrative uh, of your narrative, your story of redemption, of liberation, your story of formation of your people, of coming to dwell with your people in communion. Thank you that we get to just get a glimpse of your glory, a glimpse of your holiness, a glimpse of your beauty of salvation. And I pray today by your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate our hearts and our minds. You would illuminate the beauty and the wonder of Christ and bring him to bear all the more in our hearts and our minds that we would love you and know you all the more, that we would trust and obey you all the more. That whatever struggles and sins we bring with us today, we bring it to you. And in you we find rest, peace, forgiveness, love, joy. Would you, would you, Holy Spirit, impart that work amongst us today? May we go away today more assured and secure of who you are toward us in and through Christ Jesus as a result of what we look at today. I ask this in your gracious name. Amen. With the rise and triumph of the modern self, we're learning in our day and age that turning inward to find the answers to the deepest longings of our hearts and minds leave us deeply insecure. With the rise of the autonomous self governing, self-defining individual, we're seeing that we're not a culture who's more happy or more content. We're actually a culture and a generation that's less happy and less and more discontent in our lives. Not more secure, more insecure. Not more assured, but less assured in who we are. We live in an age and a culture where insecurity is rife. With the introduction of social media, that sin that has always existed has become manifested, heightened, and multiplied all the more. And I find more and more things, that the, the thing that more and more people are struggling with in this day and age is insecurity. There's a general insecurity in life. The uncertainty of the economy, the uncertainty of jobs, the uncertainty of nations and the stabilizations of power and governments. There's a general insecurity because of the landscape of the world that we live in. But really, the real insecurity that we're struggling with is the insecurity of self. But we don't share that honestly, though, do we? Because our culture would disapprove of us if we were to share honestly that we were insecure because that's an offense against the worthiness of self. 
But we are, aren't we? Or maybe I'm just prepared to confess that. We're constantly comparing our lives to others to see if we're okay. We're constantly figuring out how we can achieve more, earn more, increase our comfort and our lifestyle. We're constantly in this wrestle and cycle of trying to find security and affirmation in our relationships and particularly in our friendships. Does that person still like me? Does that person still love me? Does that person still want me? And we find ourselves that we're either insecure because we don't have something that we think will bring security or we're confident in self because we possess the thing that we think gives us life and meaning. Both of those are an affront to God. The language the Bible would use in light of that is confidence in the flesh. We're either confident in the flesh because we possess the thing that we think brings security and assurance in our lives, or we have confidence in the flesh because we think the thing that's lacking in our lives is the thing that will bring happiness and contentment. So we're either side of the poles. We're either insecure because we don't have, or we think we're secure because we have got something. We're putting confidence in the flesh, and in the f- putting confidence in the flesh, we come out more insecure. All of it is an affront against God because to be continually self-conscious of your insecurity is to be conscious and obsessed with self rather than the thing we're called to be, which is to love God and to love others. Our insecurities show that we are dissatisfied with God. It's nothing more than grumbling for better manna. We're sick of adequate nourishment. We want extraordinary nourishment. We don't like what God has given us, money, position, appearance, personality. We grumble for something more. And our dissatisfaction with self is nothing more than dissatisfaction with God. And that's an insult to God. Our insecurity reveals that we long for justification before people more than we long for justification before God. We care what people think of us more than we care what God thinks of us. So we try to live up, measure up, be worthy enough for the people of the world to give us acceptance and affirmation. Our insecurities merely reveal that we're still in some way believing that justification is based upon our own attributes and accomplishments. And I'm just tapping into the reality of living in a fallen, broken world as fallen, broken people. But this is so true of you and your relationship with God. What so many Christians are struggling with is a lack of security and assurance in their standing before God. Here's what I actually think. Our insecurity in the world is where we go because we have an insecurity in our relationship with God. Because we're insecure and lack assurance in our relationship with God, we rather than draw near to him and run to him, we actually run to other things in the world to find the satisfaction to the longings of our hearts that we long to have. Let me put it another way. When you sin, when you disobey God, when you miss an opportunity, when you don't read your Bible, when you don't pray, how do you think God feels about you in that moment? When you sin, do you feel God loves you? If the answer to any of those questions is no, or because you're in church, you're like, I'm not sure. It shows you lack and assurance and a security in your relationship with Jesus. That's not how God wants us to function as his people. God has done nothing nor says anything to bring insecurity or a lack of assurance in your standing before him and your ongoing walk with him to glory. In fact, it's the opposite. In our salvation and standing before him and our ongoing walk with him to glory, he's only ever speaking words of comfort and assurance and love to his people, reminding them who they are as they navigate this life to glory. Often when we sin, we miss an opportunity, we disobey, we don't read our Bible, we neglect prayer, we run from God with shame and guilt rather than to God for what we need. What you and I need in light of this reality is someone or something outside of us who will bring to us an assurance and a security in ourselves and our relationship in God so we must come to him in our times of need rather than run or turn from him as is the case in Exodus 32 with Israel. 
Israel stand at the foot of Mount Zion, that Sinai, sorry, and they see God on the top of the mountain. Moses has gone on their behalf, their representative. Their elders have gone halfway up, 70 of them, as their representatives. And they stand at the foot, and the delay, 40 days, has caused them to become insecure and lack assurance of God's promises and what God is doing in them and through them. So Moses plays this role in Exodus as someone outside of themselves so that they would know that they can stand before him. So we're going to look at what Moses does. Our deep dive today is to look at the role Moses plays and how it's a foreshadow of what Jesus does for us today. And we're answering this question, how can I live in this ongoing life with security and assurance in my walk with Jesus. How, how, can we, how can we know that when we sin, Jesus doesn't withdraw his love and affection, rather he has grace and mercy in our very need? We're answering the question, what does Jesus do when we sin? Does he still love us? What does God feel toward us when we sin? How can he continue to give us security and assurance. Well, let's look firstly at Moses. Moses in chapters 32 to 34 is playing two roles to bring the security and assurance that God people's, God's people need in their time of need. The case and example is in Exodus 32, the first 10 verses we looked at last week, we saw that God's people have sinned. What was their sin? Well, under the stress of the delay, what was exposed within them was a turning away from God and to other things. They had two choices in that delay. The stress, they were exposed, they were vulnerable, they felt insecure, they lacked assurance. They had two options as the delay happened, as Moses was on top of the mountain and God's presence was seen in the cloud. They had two options, didn't they? They could have simply trusted God's word And grow in dependence and love and trust. Or they could choose not to. Sadly, Israel choose the latter. But for our sake, the Lord has sovereignly worked that so that it becomes a lesson to us in this life. They were standing at the foot of the mountain. They were saying, where is God? What is God doing? Where is Moses? Why hasn't he come back? Does he not love us anymore? Has he left us? Does God not love us anymore? Is God abandoning us? Is Moses the only one that's going to be taken and we're all going to be wiped out? Why did God bring us out of Egypt if he just brought us here to die? What is God doing? What did we do? Have we done something that God doesn't love us anymore? I thought we did everything he told us to do. What does that mean about us? About we messed up? But what did we do? What did we not do? What did we say? What did we not say? You can just imagine... All the questions that are burning inside of them as they stand at the foot of Mount Sinai. And under that insecurity, they had that choice. No, even though we feel like this, God's word is true. Sadly, as we do, they succumb under the temptation to find assurance and trust in something else rather than God. So they build the golden calf. They build the golden calf not as a replacement to God, but to function as a physical, tangible reminder that God is there. Interesting that. They bring something physical, not to replace God, because their sin isn't rejecting that God. It's that they couldn't live under stress. They couldn't live with insecurity. They couldn't live without a lack of assurance. So they needed something physical, tangible, so that they could feel worth. They could feel that they were something. They could feel they were significant. They could look at something and go, that's our God. Let's make sacrifice to that God because it's right there. They couldn't live in the midst of insecurity. So how does God respond? Well, we read it in, uh, sorry, in verse 10. He says that he would pour out his wrath, that he would, his anger and his wrath would burn hot against them and he would consume them because of their sin. He could and he should have. But enters Moses, verse 11. Moses enters and plays a role, two roles, intercessor and advocate on their behalf so they can live in relationship with God with confidence, with security, with assurance, and God won't blot them out. 
What's that first role he does? We read it in verses 11 to 14. The role Moses plays, firstly, is as intercessor. An intercessor is somebody who stands in the middle between two parties that are at odds with each other. Clearly, this is God, and this is God's people. They're at odds with each other, and he stands in the middle as an intercessor to intercede to bring reconciliation between these two parties. And what's interesting is that God is actually leading him to do this. God's actually leading him to it by he's essentially saying, I've seen what they did, and this is what I will do unless someone does something different. God was leading Moses to step into this rule because God could have destroyed them. God could have blotted them out in an instant and started again. But Moses intercedes, verses 11 to 14. We see him intercede with three particular things. Firstly, over God's glory. Don't blot them out because of your glory. Don't blot them out, verse 11, because you, for your mighty hand, have brought them out of the land of Egypt with your power. Don't blot them out because this is about your glory. If you blot them out and destroy them, your glory will be diminished. The second thing is, is reputation among the nations, verse 12. Don't blot them out because if you blot them out, the nations will think that you simply brought them out of a mighty hand to destroy them. That does, you're, you're just like all the other gods who are angry. And the third reason, verse 13, don't blot them out because of your promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Israel. Moses steps into the gap between God's people and God, two parties that are at odds with each other, God's enemies now because of their sin. And Moses steps in and pleads with God, intercedes on their behalf, don't blot them out because of these reasons. Do you see, see, interestingly, nothing to do with how good they were, nothing to do with their obedience, nothing to do with their works, nothing to do with their actions, no reasons in and of themselves should God save them, but everything because of God, his character, his glory, his reputation, his promises. And what does God do? Verse 14, he relents. Now, if anybody was wondering last week, God's not changing his mind here. God was inviting Moses to intercede. Moses did, and when he did, God's anger turned away. God wasn't changing his plans. Moses was carrying out God's plans. And what we learn from this passage is that we need an intercessor. We need one. If we identify with God's people in the story, we're not Moses, by the way, and we're certainly not God in the story. We are God's people. We sin. We need an intercessor who will come and mediate on our behalf so we don't get what we deserve. Second role Moses plays is his advocate. Verses 15 to 30. We went through these last week, so I'm not going to read one, uh, one by one. But an advocate is someone who comes alongside the offended party to see their plight, to sympathize with them, to, to see and experience what they are experiencing, and then to speak and act on their behalf for their good. So they, Moses comes over to the people of God. He sees them, and this is what happens. Verse 15, he comes down the mountain. He descends down the mountain. He crosses over from the, the, the presence of God, descends down the mountain to see the people in their plight and their sin, and then to intercede and to advocate on their behalf. He becomes the mediator. He comes down the mountain. He sees their sin. We see that when he throws down the tablets of stone. His own anger burns against what they have done and can see that they have broke loose and have not trusted God's word. He goes to Aaron and he rebukes Aaron for blame shifting with his own responsibility of what he's done in this act. But then Moses does this, verse 26. He calls them to repentance. He calls them to come over to the Lord's side. Come to me. Who's on the Lord's side? He gives them a message of salvation. He calls them to repentance. He calls them to come away from their idolatry and come over to the Lord's side and be spared. It's a message of salvation. Here is the mediator. He comes down from the presence of God amongst the people of God, gives them a message of salvation, calls them to come over to the Lord's side. And then what happens next, verse 30? He announces to them, you've sinned a great sin, now I will go and see if I can atone for your sin. Is this beginning to sound familiar, by the way? But he doesn't just say, let's see if I can go and see if I can convince God to relent. What does he actually say? 
verse 31. So to the Lord, this people have sinned a great sin that they have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of your book, not them. He goes and offers himself as an atoning sacrifice. He goes himself and he says, don't blot them out. If you need to blot anyone's name out of the book, blot my name out. Here is Moses descending from the presence of God to see the experience of God's people, to see their sin, to see their plight, to experience what they're experiencing, and then to offer this message of salvation. Come to the Lord's side. Don't stay here. God's wrath will burn against you. Come over to the Lord's side. He goes to the Lord. Don't blot them out. Blot me out instead. He goes as their advocate. We learn we need someone to intercede, to stand in the gap. We learn we need an advocate to come to our side to see our sin, but not become sin and sin like us, but to represent us, to go and offer themselves as atonement. The people on the ground lack security and assurance and they're standing before the Lord. So one stepped in to intercede, to advocate on their behalf so that they are not blotted out. Sound familiar? It's all pointing ahead to the true and better, true and better Moses. And that's what we'll look at secondly. Jesus is the true and better Moses. 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 to 6 says this. For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. You see, we're to look at Moses and realize that Moses couldn't do what Jesus can only do. Moses could have gone, brought me out instead of them, but only that people would have been spared. What about us today? What about us today? We couldn't have been saved by Moses' sacrifice. We needed a true and better Moses, and that is why the Lord relents from his disaster, but why the Lord makes a promise in verse 34 of Exodus 32 that one day one will be blotted out. One day, one will be blotted out. You see, Jesus comes as our advocate and intercessor. He mediates between us and God to bring us the security and assurance that we can stand before God. We're like the people of Israel. We sin. Our sin is idolatry. We commit spiritual adultery on God on a daily basis. We run after other things to give us what only God can give us. Under stress and insecurity, we turn to the tangible and temporary to find security and assurance that can only be found in God. All sin involves this crazy loss of perspective. We all laughed last week when Chris took us through the narrative. We laughed when we saw the people of God at the bottom of Mount Sinai looking up at the mountain, looking at God's presence, literally on the mountain, we were like, how could they do that? And I ask us, how can we do it? And his presence dwells in us. We lose sight of God's generous provision. We grasp our envy. We turn to other things. What we experience is a spiritual ruin. We are separated and cut off from God. We experience personal ruin. We experience the brokenness of sin in our lives. We experience relational ruin, breakdown in our relationships. But our focus today is not on our sin. Our focus today is on Christ and what he does. Some dead theologians said, for every look at sin, take 10 looks at Jesus. So let's take 10 looks at Jesus today. Jesus is our intercessor. As Moses interceded based on God's glory, God's reputation to the nation, and his promises. So Jesus comes as the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God who becomes like us in human flesh. He perfectly represents the Father to us. He comes as the reputation of God where he reveals his character perfectly to us and he comes as the fulfillment of those promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He comes as the true and better one. He descends from the throne room of heaven and incarnates around us. He comes and experiences what we experience. He comes to receive what we receive, should have received. He comes to take the wrath of God that we deserve. He can sympathize with us. He experienced loss and grief and pain and suffering, but he did it all without sin. Jesus comes and speaks a message of salvation. He calls people to repentance in him, to come over to his side, to leave behind all that they know and to follow him. He's not just a messenger, he's a mediator. He's the one who doesn't just call us to salvation, but the one who makes salvation possible. On the night before he died, he prayed this prayer. Father, the hour has come. 
Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. What was the time? What was the glorification? It was the cross. The greatest revelation of the divine glory of God is the mercy of God and acted in and through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus pursues the glory of the Father by giving himself as a divine sacrifice, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. As Moses said, blot me out, so so Jesus says, blot me out. So as, as Moses said, forgive them, blot me out. So Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And therefore, he was blotted out. He was blotted out of the book so that our names could enter in. Moses offered an atonement. Jesus was the atonement for sins. Instead of receiving the punishment we deserve, he goes in our place and receives the wrath of God in our place. He dies the once and for all sacrifice for us. At Calvary, Jesus hangs in darkness in our place with his name blotted out of the book, hung, crucified, so that we can go free. So our sins are atoned for once and for all. So our names are in the book of life and they will never be blotted out because Jesus received what we received. Here's the good news. Jesus will acknowledge you before the Father because he took the punishment in your place. He will acknowledge you now before the Father and he will acknowledge you then when you come into the Father's presence because he was blotted out for us. So brother and sister, if you're lacking security and assurance in your relationship with God, stop looking at yourself. Don't buy into this culture of self-defined, self-truth, self-governing. Look away from yourself. Look to the Savior. There's nothing in here about our actions. All we contribute is our sin. What Jesus does is everything that's required so that our sin will not keep us out of the presence of God, but we can come into his presence. We can now draw near because Jesus was cut off in our place. There's no sin that you can sin that will out-sin his grace. His mercy is more. Is that your view of Jesus? Is that your view of Jesus when you sin? Is that your view of Jesus when you disobey? Is that your view of Jesus when you miss that opportunity? Is that your view of Jesus when you've neglected your Bible all week and forgotten to pray? Do you believe that today Jesus is looking upon you with the same smile and affection and love that, than, the, than when you first believed? Do you believe that? Do you have the same security and assurance that the Father looks upon you with delight and joy than when he did when you first believed? It should be, yeah? You can't answer. Yes. And if you're struggling to do that, we're praying, Holy Spirit, give us the faith to walk in that to believe in it because I tell you what you know when the affection of the father came upon you it wasn't when you first believed we need to stop being so man centered in our theology the affection of the father was set upon you before the foundation of the world and when the son executed his own sacrifice for you you weren't even born yet get over yourself Security and assurance comes in the actions of the Son, in the work of the Father and the Holy Spirit, so we can rest. But the question looms large. It's great, Josh. That was what Jesus did in salvation. I get that. Jesus paid for my sin once and for all. He he purchased me. But you don't know. I've had the same habitual sin for 20 years. But Josh, you don't know what I did this week. But Josh, you don't know what I've done or who I did it to. You don't know. I don't feel like this anymore because look what I've done. Look at all the actions and mistakes I've made. Look at all the regrets, the shame, and the guilt that I have. Look at this continuing sin pattern in my life. Surely, but surely, I have outsinned his grace. Surely now... Jesus is not happy with me anymore. Surely now his affection has waned. Surely now he has fallen out of love with me. Surely now his heart has grown cold to me as I continually stand at the bottom of the mountain and make idols and make spiritual adultery with them right before his presence. Surely now, Josh. No, you'd be wrong. 
Because Jesus' role of intercessor and advocate didn't end at the cross and resurrection. He continues to play those roles now for us. So we're answering the question, when I sin, as those who've been redeemed, brought out of slavery to sin, just like Israel were, just like those as they were stood at the bottom of the mountain, as they sin, how does Jesus respond to us? What does Jesus feel toward us when we sin now? That's the question we're answering. Well, Jesus responds of his continued role as advocate and intercessor. Firstly, Jesus' ongoing role as advocate. 1 John 2. 1 John 2 verse 1 says this. My little children, in writing these things, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. That's the goal of the Christian life. Do not sin. Yikes. Guilty. That is the life that is worthy to the Father, a life of how sin. That is the life that is accepted by the Father when we do not sin. We're not to sin. Everything we're saying today doesn't give you permission to sin either. It should be the fuel in the tank to cause us to put the sin to death. But the passage doesn't leave us in depression and despair and hopelessness. It continues to liberate us. Look at what it says. But if anyone does sin, cliffhanger. Uh Uh-oh, this is us. We have an advocate. Wipe the sweat off the brow, literally. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It doesn't leave us depressed and hopeless and despair. It gives us hope. It says that there is one when we are feeling crushed by guilt, overwhelmed with shame. Jesus knows what you're experiencing because he incarnate in this world and now he continues to advocate for you. He is our comforter, our counselor, our helper, our assistant. It's clear from this definition of advocate that we want an advocate on our side, one who has our interests at heart, one who knows us and cares about us and is willing to step in and help us in our time of need. This is what Jesus does now when you sin. Who here thinks that when you sin, Jesus just leaves the room? Who here thinks when we sin that Jesus is just like, that's it, had enough, I'm done? See you later. And he's just left. No. He feels what we feel. And he draws near to us in our time of need. And he speaks longingly on our behalf. Why? Because he is righteous. He's righteous. We're not. Even our best repenting and works don't bring him to us Even that itself is plagued with sin. We need a true and better advocate. This is the wonderful truth. When we sin, Jesus is our advocate on our behalf. To come to the Father without an advocate is hopeless. But to be allied with this advocate who came to seek us when we were lost, to save us, to make us his own, means that we can come before the Father with a calm confidence, full assurance, and security. Recent book quoting a load of Puritans, puts it like this. Christ's advocacy is God's way of encouraging us not to throw in the towel. Who here, who here arrived this morning going, this is the last chance? If you don't speak to me today, God, I'm out. If you don't move in my life the way that I say you should move, I'm out. His advocacy is the way of encouraging us not to throw in the towel. Yes, we feel Christ as his disciples, but his advocacy on our behalf rises higher than our sins. His advocacy speaks louder than our failures. All is taken care of. All is taken care of. We can rest. What a wonderful Savior, amen? That's our God. His advocacy brings our, the encouragement we need in our darkest, most shame-filled moments. No matter how loudly our internal voices say, you've done too much this time, you've outsinned his grace, he is louder. No matter how loudly Satan accuses us, Jesus is stronger. No matter how deeply our shame pulls us into despair and hopelessness, he lifts us up and draws us to himself and rescues us and he is on our side continually. 
Nothing can separate us from that love. You know what, folks? Believing this truth will lead you to being not insecure. There's no peace like the peace of those whose hearts and minds are filled with this truth. There's no peace that can be found, no physical or tangible thing in this world is sufficient to bring a peace that it comes when our minds and hearts are possessed and inflamed, that we are known by God and we can know Him. That because of Christ, He guarantees His favor upon us through this life, through death, and into glory. Jesus is our advocate in salvation. He's our advocate all the way through this life until we see him face to face when he will acknowledge us before the Father and will embrace us and welcome us in. So if you feel insecure in the world, in whatever aspect of this fallen, broken world you feel insecurity press high, your solution isn't to go into the world and find something else. It's to come back to the Father and rest that you're known. You're known by him. You're free to live. The second role that Jesus continues to play, and our last one today, is his ongoing role of intercession. Hebrews 7, 25. It says this, Consequently, that word's there because Hebrews to this point has been telling us that Jesus is the true and better high priest. What Aaron and his descendants couldn't do, Jesus could do. He is the permanent one. So therefore, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The the, the author of Hebrews is trying to convince us that Jesus is the true and better high priest who lives to make constant and unbroken intercession on our behalf. The reason we have hope and assurance that our sins will never cut us off from Jesus is because Jesus himself is seated at the right hand of the Father right now, interceding on your behalf, pouring out on us whatever we need in our time of need. Jesus' present work today wasn't that he's sitting on a lilo just sipping a pina colada in the sun. Jesus is actively working. I know some of you wish that's where you were right now, but that's Jesus is actively working right now. He didn't ascend and then put his feet up. No, he ascended and sat down and put his feet on his enemies, and he's interceding for us right now. He hasn't left us behind to figure out on our own. He's working. He's interceding on our behalf to the Father, but don't hear me wrong. Don't be mistaken. He's not trying to convince the Father like Moses did. Please don't blot them out. Please, No. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are delighting by applying the atoning work to us continually. He is continually pouring out His atoning work on us. He's not trying to convince the Father because He's a harsh headmaster trying to blot out His students who are disobeying Him. No, He's a loving Father who delights to answer His Son with a yes. And the Son is saying, let's love them, let's delight in them because I have already atoned for their sin. I've removed it once and for all. Jesus is talking to the Father about what He has already done on our behalf. And we experience the love of the Father through the Son as He continually hits refresh on our justification. Dana Orland's a great phrase. Constantly hits refresh on our justification in the presence of the Father. And look at this verse. He's able to save to the uttermost. So to you here is saying, Josh, but you don't know my sin. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the shame. You don't know the guilt I have. You don't know who I did it to. You don't know what happens. You can't say this because surely the one thing that I have done is beyond what Christ will save. And the word uttermost is there is the only time it's used in the Bible. So it's significant to show us the length to which he saves is to the uttermost. We're uttermost sinners. He's an uttermost savior. We sin to that degree, and he covers that sin by his grace. There's nothing lacking, nothing lacking. He covers all our sin. Nothing is left out. Nothing's defective. He's done it. But I know some of you are still like, I struggle to believe that, Josh. Praise the Lord is not based on your amount of faith. Amen? (laughs) but all in his work. And if anybody ever tells you that something is being blocked because of your lack of faith, slap him in the face with this verse. 
and the rest of the Bible. Gently. We struggle to believe this, but our belief and struggle doesn't define whether it's true or not. His son on the cross proves it. Most of us reach the point of frustration and we're just repeated failures and we think, ah, God must just throw his arms up at me. No, this word uttermost is telling us that we've misunderstood and misjudged who God is and what he continues to do for us today all the way to glory. There are no lengths to which God in Christ won't go to save you. He's accomplished everything once and for all. You're his rest. So do you here feeling insecure, lacking assurance? Rest. But it doesn't finish there. That's, that's the length to which he goes to save. But look at the next, uh, the rest of the verse. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Always. It speaks about duration of time. It means never ending, never ceasing. It points to the reality of the eternal work of the Son. The one thing that lasts in this life. The one thing that lasts in this life is the heavenly intercession of Jesus on our behalf. Amen? Jesus continues to live to make intercession even when we prove faithless and keep failing and make golden calves at the foot of the mountain when he stood on the top of it. He continues to do it. So when we're tempted to look to someone or to someone else other than Jesus to bring about our security and our assurance in our relationship and standing with him, when we're tempted to believe other things other than Jesus, when we're tempted to believe that we need to do certain things that we loved and could be continued loved by Jesus, we're to rebuke ourselves knowing that nothing and no one can remove that guilt and sin, only him. And therefore, we should, look at the middle of the verse, draw near to him. Draw near to God through him. So why can you have assurance and security in your relationship with Jesus, both your salvation and your ongoing walk? It's because of his advocacy, his intercession on your behalf, our behalf. When you sin, what does Jesus do? He advocates. He's on your side continually. When you sin, what does he do? He intercedes on your behalf. How awesome is our God? Amen? He's ever-present, ready to supply with the help we need, with the encouragement we need to help us get through this life to glory. So what should we do? We should draw near to him. What is it that you need most? Is it forgiveness of sins and freedom from the guilt and shame that you've been carrying around your whole life? Then draw near to him. Is it renewed hope that God has a purpose for your life? That he'll truly work all things together for good? Then draw near to him. Is it peace and joy to come from the promises he's made? Then draw near to him. It doesn't require you to walk down an aisle. It requires you to cry with desperation, recognizing your need and recognizing his sufficiency and drawing near to him. Lord, deliver me, help me, heal me, deliver, strengthen, whatever it is. Draw near to him through Jesus. Why don't we? If that is true, why do we not draw near? What is it within us that stops us from drawing near? Why do we keep turning to these other things? Why do we believe the lies of the evil one and the lies of the world? Why do we run into the midst of the world, find ourselves overwhelmed of insecurities and lacking assurance of who we are, and we just tunnel into it all the more, rather than coming back to him and find our assurance and security in him, and then walk free? You who are feeling overwhelmed by that boss who you can never approve, those work colleagues who never live up to their standards, those relationships and friendships, the social media that is driving us all crazy because my life's not like theirs. Draw near to him. Find your rest in him and stop. (laughs) Put it to death. The greatest thing you could do just for a few moments is probably just to stop. Turn it all off. Stop. Rest in this truth. Then go free. Is that amazing incident in the Gospels when the woman who committed adultery and all they're there with their stones and Jesus says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Then what does he say to the woman? 
go and sin no more. Because when you encounter Jesus, his call is go and sin no more. 1 John 2. But if you do sin, we have an advocate. What restricts us in walking free and going to sin no more isn't anything that Jesus does. It's not the fault of the church. (laughs) It is the reality that our own affections constrain us. 2 Corinthians 6, 12. We're restricted by our own affections. We actually just really love that world. But look how glorious the Savior is. Look how beautiful he is. What's holding you back? Draw near to God through him. So if you're weary and worn out, draw near to him through Jesus and you will find strength to endure. To the shame-filled and downtrodden, draw near to God through Jesus Christ and he will cleanse you of all guilt and shame. To the brokenhearted whose dreams and desires never seem to materialize like that person on Instagram, draw near to God. He will fill your heart with the longings and desires that you really want. To those who have lost hope, draw near to God through Jesus Christ and he will restore hope with his promises. To those who are broken and weak in body, draw near to God through Jesus and he will heal you. Draw near to him, you who are filled with anxiety and worries, and he will impart his peace which surpasses all understanding. So those of us who are wounded, we've been abused by someone else, a parent, a spouse, a worker, whatever it is, draw near to him and you will find a friend who can be trusted and heal those wounds and love you the way that love was meant to be done. To any of us who believe the lie that nothing will ever change in our lives, draw near to him through Jesus and he will make all things new. And so whatever else I didn't cover on that, draw near to God through Jesus. He understands. He's experienced what we experienced and he can do it. Let's pray. Father, we draw near to you now in the confidence of your son, Jesus. In his flesh, not ours. We draw near humbly, recognizing we have only ever contributed sin to our need. And you are a true and better savior. You're the uttermost savior who saves to the uttermost You're the one who has advocated, come to our side, drawn near to us, walked amongst us, seen us in our sin and our plight, yet still went to the cross and became sin. You who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. You have done that work. We fall down humbly. Who are we? And you lift us up saying, you're in me. That's who you are. Our Father, we, we struggle with insecurity, not just in the world, but in our walk with you. We lack assurance because we believe the lies of the evil one that our sin is too big for your grace. So Holy Spirit, please would you draw near to us and bring to bear this truth in our hearts and our minds. Possess our hearts and our minds with this truth that we may know you all the more and we would walk free in this life To imagine that the greatest missionary activity we could do across the world to see people one for you is to actually simply walk free of insecurity and a lack of assurance of who we are might actually be one of the greatest signs to a lost generation who is rife of insecurity. Lord, please use us. But Lord, to use us, would you change us? change our hearts, change our minds to believe the truths of your word that we may walk in it and we may know you all the more. We're sorry for our sin. We're sorry for our unbelief. But thank you that we here in you, there is now no condemnation. Spirit, would you minister to the weary and worn out, to the shame-filled and downtrodden, to the broken-hearted, to those who have lost hope, to those who are broken in body, those filled with anxiety and worry, those who have been wounded, to those who have lost all sense of hope. Spirit, would you draw near and comfort, lift up, 
hold tightly and help us to walk free. And we ask this humbly in your gracious name. Amen.